all. Good morning, Redemption. How are you guys doing today? Nice. All right. Man, I have to tell you, in the book of Revelation, it says that Jesus makes all things new. And part of that is in the future, but there are new things made every single day. For example, last Sunday, there was a new record. Longest sermon ever. All right. <laughs> All things new, one hour, eight minutes, you all deserve a gold star, good for you, all right. I had people afterwards going, dude, I loved it, but my bladder, I can't, there's no center aisle, you can't escape. So, um, yeah, so good for you guys, today won't be an hour and eight minutes, I promise it'll be like an hour or six, all right. So, uh, let's go ahead and get underway with a word of prayer, and uh, we'll get right to business. Jesus, I thank you for your word, I thank you for the fact that your word is life, I think for the fact that your word is not just ink on a page that, are, that is kind of riddled with philosophies for our life, but more importantly, uh, it is literally life. It is sustenance. There is power behind your word. There is strength behind your word. There is encouragement. There is the reminder to press forward when it's hard, knowing that there is great future reward. And so I pray as we continue our series that our heart is to look toward the future as a mobilizer for the present, that the power of your word would infuse our lives and drive us every single day in the little things and the big things, in the painful times and in the joyful times. We would be people of your word because we are people for your glory and we want more of you. And so we ask that you would do those types of things through your word today in our lives. In your awesome name we ask these things. Amen. All right, so uh, we are in a series right now. We have been in it now for six weeks. We have two more weeks to go in the series, and it's all about heaven and hell and a world without end, and we have sort of gone through that whole journey, and we've now stepped into this reality that there is a world beyond this world that is a real world, and it's a world that literally is without end. Now, in studying some of this, part of the challenge, and I've referred to this throughout the series, uh, part of the challenge is the fact that we have to sometimes undo some of our thinking and then construct new thinking. And, and I find when we start to talk about the reality of God's final future world, we have to deconstruct some things. We have to undo a little bit of our thinking. In fact, one of the things that we as, as Western Christians uh, and historically as Christians have had a challenge with is the idea of how the Greek philosophers have influenced some of our perspectives. All right, now that, that could probably uh, be talked about in a variety of ways, but, but one of the ways was through a philosopher named Plato, not the dough that's colored, but a dude, that had a lot of different ideas, and one of his ideas was this notion that what is truly good, what is truly noble, what, what is truly a virtue are things that are intangible. He believed that the spirit realm was truly spiritual and good. The physical realm, so tables and people and our bodies and materials, those were less virtuous. And, and so he kind of purported, and, and others kind of carried it along, the idea that the physical world is a less spiritual thing or a less virtuous thing. And Christians at times grab that and said, that's right, you know, material things are just, come on, they're going to burn. They're not as important as the kind of spirit floating, non-physical kinds of things. In fact, even in the early life of the church, there's a group called the Gnostics. And if you've ever heard about the Gnostic Gospels or you read uh, what was it, um, the Da Vinci Code, uh, it refers to the Gnostic Gospels and Gnostic writings, and the Gnostics were among those people that said the physical's bad, only the spiritual is good. And they would say that even Jesus himself didn't rise from the dead physically because that would mean he was sinful because the physical is sinful, physical is bad, right? Now, I'm saying all of this because, again, some of our visions about heaven that we've tried to undo are these visions that make it cloudy, make it very light, make it non tangible to some way, or if it's tangible, it's barely tangible, just a few tangible things like robes and harps, nothing else that's really tangible, very wispy, if you will. And yet that's a broken vision. 
right? Even Jesus himself, when he rises from the dead, what did we see last week in Luke 24? He has flesh, he has bone, he has wounds, he says, touch my wounds, he eats fish, he consumes food. All of that is very physical, and God is God. God is perfect. Jesus is God, and Jesus is perfect, so the physical isn't bad. And so don't start to think of heaven as this just floaty, wispy place because that's more spiritual, but we've been contaminated by that, so we don't want to think in those terms. The world that we are talking about is spiritual, but it is a physical, spiritual world. That is the first thing. The other thing that I want to make sure that we begin to construct is actual visions of heaven from the Bible. Now, I, I say that because I had a, a good friend of mine, uh, when I was telling them that I was going to do this series, I said, yeah, it's going to be a whole series about heaven. And they're like, you don't have much to work with in the Bible on that. You know, like, there's really nothing said about it. Maybe just a couple of verses here, a chapter or two there, and that's all, and nothing else. And I disagree. I said, you know, actually, I don't think that's the case. Now, here's what I think when we start to study heaven um, one of the realities, uh, if you look at the Old Testament law, for example, it's going to be like a textbook, you know, where you've got, you know, just chapter after chapter of information, and it's just like that. The study of heaven in your Bible is like reading tweets, all right? It's, it's all throughout in these different little nuggets. It might just be one verse here or two verses there. It's always giving us this foretaste, this appetite for, like, oh, I see a verse. I, I wonder where that's going. I want to know more. And it's designed, I believe, to create this sense of anticipation. Like, oh, I can't wait to see that get unpacked. I want to know exactly what that's going to mean in the future. I don't even know what to do with that, but boy, it starts my imagination going, and, and, and we should bring our imagination to the table, because Paul says, whatever you can imagine, this reality is beyond your imagination, but that doesn't mean don't imagine. I, I believe it actually encourages some sense of imagination based on the text. Seeing a verse and saying, well, what do I do with that, and where might that go, and what would that look like? in this new world. Now, last week, when we were together, um, we noted that there are the bookends of the Bible, right? So there is Genesis and there's Revelation, and Genesis opens with a garden, and Revelation closes with a garden enshrined by a city, right? And we said that there's been this progress, this development, this growth, and as real as Eden was, this city garden of the future is going to be equally real. It's not make-believe, it's not pretend, it's none of that. It's a real city. It is a city that is 1,400 miles long and 1,400 miles high. It's the most amazing city ever. It's a two million square mile at the base level city. New York is the largest square mile city in the world right now at 4,500 square miles. The new Jerusalem, this great capital city of God, is two million square miles just at the base. This is an immense city. It has advanced architecture, exotic materials, and it is a haven for all sorts of diversity, for advancement, for wonder, for awe, and God dwells in the middle of this. And his very presence is the atmosphere and the illumination of the city. We said that this is an impressive capital city. Unlike anything, we can even begin to imagine. And I want to keep emphasizing, and it's real. It's real. It's physical and real. When John is describing the materials of the city, he's describing materials that are composites of the periodic table of elements. It's a real, tangible city. Now, during this time, when this new Jerusalem comes and the old Jerusalem is transformed, it says, in this environment, there is more, no more pain or hurt or death or sin or separation. It's a federation of people and angels. And by the way, really quick, it's a freebie because you showed up. Um, we tend to think of angels as clones, and they're not. You have seraphim and cherubim, or boom, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And, and, and so all of a sudden you have angels, but then you have two different groups within that angelic world and you dig down a little bit further and you see there's more diversity even there you you see in the book of revelation there's the four living creatures and they're very different than angels and they look very different from one another so don't start getting really myopic and saying in this future world everybody looks the same no you have this federation of diversity of angels a federation of diversity of people 
And then there's no longer separation between us and God. It's quite an exotic world that God has in store for his people. And what I love about it is while it's very diversified, it's also very unified, right? It's unified. All of these different groups are not at odds. They're not competing against one another in negative ways. They're not trying to one-up the other side. There is no concern about somebody crossing somebody's border and somebody else freaking out. Next thing you know, there's a campaign. right? All of that that we see every day when we turn on the news or we go to our favorite news site, those concerns about nationalism, about racism, about bigotry and bias and hatred, they're gone. God establishes this great utopian society, not getting rid of its diversity, but leveraging all of the beauty of its diversity in a giant sense of oneness. And then we said at the end of last week, imagine yourself in the midst of that, that you'll be there, your real you, your most real you. Now, people always ask when I talk about this, they'll they'll grab me afterwards and they'll say, so what am I going to look like? Am I going to be young me, old me? You know, what what me am I going to be? And, and, you know, I I can't answer that. What I do know is that uh, when Jesus rose from the dead, he would have to actively conceal himself so people didn't recognize him. It says he concealed it from their eyes when he didn't want to be seen by people. But when he just revealed himself, they all knew it was Jesus. Jesus looked like Jesus. Yeah, I can't help in my own imagination to kind of wonder. It's like when, when I look at a picture of my grandmother as a child, and I can see my grandmother in that little child's face still. Like you can always kind of see the person no matter what the age. I almost wonder if like we're just going to always see the different facets of the same person, almost the different facets of their age always, like always before you. You just recognize them. You just know them. You will be your real you in a real place that is God's great reigning kingdom. Now what we said in this is that this is this one aspect of the whole reign of God, right? So we just looked at a city. So there's this great new Jerusalem, comes from heaven, sets itself into the world, has gates and walls and a metropolis. But but we said it doesn't stop there. We said there are these gates that have, um, there's three gates on each side of the city. And we we said, you know, gates go someplace. You you go into a city, you go out of a city. So gates go in and out. What's about going in and out? Or, Or we said that John sees the city from a great high mountain in the distance. It doesn't say the mountain like it's the only mountain, just a mountain. And it's in the distance. So somehow we have things that go out. We have a mountain in the distance. We have a river that flows from the city of God. And and again, as somebody that loves rivers, I'm like, where does that river go? Where does it go? It must go somewhere, right? So that's really what this morning is all about. What is beyond the city? I want us to expand our vision to go, wow, we're not just talking about a, a city that is the dwelling place of God and people and that's all. Again, we're talking about a realm something much bigger. And it starts in Revelation chapter 21, verse 23. It's describing the city of the New Jerusalem, and it says, The city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it. For the glory of God gives its light, and the lamp is the Lamb, who is Jesus. So somehow, in their fully revealed glory and power, they become the atmosphere of the city. I don't mean literally they're in the atmosphere like the atmosphere and God are one and the same. I'm just saying the glory of God is so intense in the city, it consumes the atmosphere of the city. It illuminates the air, brings life in every way possible. And then in verse 24, this is what I love about this. It says, and by its light will the nations walk Right? It doesn't say what were once the nations. It says the nations that will exist in this realm. These nations will walk in that light. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Right? So I, I want you to just soak that in for a second. Right? Because again, our very narrow view of heaven is that there's God and we're all in a giant choir for eternity. And we just look at the throne. Lord, I lift your name on high for the 10th trillion time. 
right? And then we just keep singing it all the time. We're all in rows. We all look the same, all white robes, no real difference in one God, and that's all. But that's not what we're seeing here. We're seeing this developed, vast, expansive city, and now we see there are gates that go someplace, a river that goes someplace, a mountain in the distance, and then we have kings. You go, well, I thought there was only one king. What do you mean kings? Plural. Heaven only has one king. No, heaven has one king of kings. Heaven has one king of kings. This new world, though, appears from this to have other kings. Now, here's what I want us to keep in mind. Think like a biblical Christian. The kings of the world to come, you know who they were in this world? The slaves. They were the servants. Jesus was very clear in his ministry. He says, you want to be greatest in the kingdom? Be the least of all. See, we build our little kingdoms in this world. We fight for our moniker, our prestige, our power, our authority. We want little letters before our names, the little letters after our names. And Jesus says, you know what, in this world, you kind of get your reward for all of that. But in the world to come, those who are the least of all, those I reward with some pretty impressive things. They become the kings of the new world. No wonder Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords, because in Philippians 2 it says, he became the slave of all. Jesus is king of kings because he was the slave of slaves in this world. It's a good reminder for how we live in this world. This world shapes what we do in the world to come. That's not an overstatement. That's a reality. And so again, the kings of the new world will be those who are the servants and slaves and the one that we know now. Now, of course, if there's kings, what do you have? You have nations, right? And that's what we see here. There are the nations that come to the new Jerusalem. I don't know if that's through ambassadors. I don't know how that works, that the nations will come to this one great capital city. But just think about what makes a nation a nation. I mean, this is where you don't even have to use a lot of imagination. You just have to kind of stop and think about it and say, okay, what makes China, China? What makes, uh, I don't know, the United States, the United States? What makes Canada, Canada? I mean, you just start to think about those things. You're like, Canada, toques, hockey, syrup. You know, like, like, this is what makes Canada, Canada, beer. You know, like, you just start to think, oh, every nation has this, this tone, this uniqueness. They have a particular style of art, of architecture. I mean, you think about China, you, you, you know when you see a building, a picture of China. You just know, right? There's no question Versus you see a, a, a structure in Russia, you know, you see the Kremlin, and you, you know that's an architecture that's unique to them. You, you look in the United States, and we have architecture that is unique to us. You think about cuisine, right? Cuisine is just food as art, and, and we have unique foods. That's why we want to go to, you know, I'll go to the Thai restaurant today, and then I'll go to the, the Mexican restaurant tomorrow, and then after that we're going to go to Chinese. And you know, think, Nobody goes to Canadian. They don't really have a cuisine, but um, you know, I love Canada, but they, they have beer. It's what they have. They don't have cuisine, right? They have comedians and hockey and beer, and that's about it, um, and toques. So, but, but you get the idea that don't, don't just think like, oh, the nations and we, because here's what our tendency is when we talk about heaven or the eternal world of God, we start to liquefy it all into kind of looking the same, right? We just do. We just automatically kind of socialize it. Heaven's just this giant socialist realm. Everybody gets the same robe. And here we say, no, there's nations. And nations are diverse. They have diverse music. They have diverse appearance. They have diverse engineering and things of that nature. And so you want to look and go, wow, you know, if their language is different, their culture is different, their style is different, why wouldn't that still carry over? See, God has created diversity, right? People try to rob the word diversity from God, but God is the ultimate diversifier, right? And so he retains this diversity in this new world. And so you have kings, and and, and those kings then have some responsibility to Nations. In fact, even in Revelation 7, 9, it says, A great multitude from every nation and tribe and people and language are in heaven, waiting to go into this new world. 
And again, I just can't emphasize enough, because of that, there is uniqueness, there is beauty, there is creativity, there is this, this difference of people groups in this new world. And God loves that. God loves that diversity. That's why he ports it into this new world, because he loves it. Now, if you have kings and you have nations, then what do you realistically need to have in relationship to that? Territory, right? Space, land. I mean, that's kind of when you think kings and you think nations, you don't just automatically think, and they're all in a very small building in one location. Right? You go, no, they must have space. In Ezekiel chapter 34, we begin to look at this. In fact, a lot of what we're, we're going to be looking at this morning is going to be out of the Old Testament. And, and there's a reason for that, because uh, when God was dealing with the people of Israel, he would remind them that there is a future coming, a future that will be the final, complete fulfillment of the future. And there's promises that are embedded in there. Now, different people will look at these promises in different ways. I'm not getting into all of that. They all agree that it's future. It's the future. After Jesus comes, this is the future. And so that's the way I'm looking at these passages. After Jesus comes, this is the future. Now, when we look at some of these passages, intermixed within a chapter, there might be something that talks about an immediate fulfillment that's in the past, but then it also talks about a future fulfillment that is the final fulfillment. We call that foreshadowing. So you, you see that within these chapters, but there are very concrete things in some of the things we're looking at this morning that are that final culminating end. And one of the things you see in the final culminating end is not just what we saw in Revelation, which is kings and nations, but you also see that there is some sense of environment or territory. In fact, I love this in Ezekiel 34, starting in verse 25, right? And this is God saying, this is what I'm going to do in the final future. He says, I will make with them a covenant of peace and I will banish the wild beasts. We're not going to get into that yet, but just the fact that you know this is the future when he says, there are no more wild beasts. That's clearly not now. There's still plenty of wild beasts. He says, but one day I will banish the wild beasts from the land so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. Now, it would be very easy for us to just, especially when you're reading Ezekiel, You'd be like, oh, I'm just glazed over. I don't even know what all of this is. I'm just trying to get through it to the New Testament where I know what's going on. All right? So, like, I get that, right? You get Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and honestly, you're like, I, I just need vitamin D and sunshine right now to heal me. All right? But, but if you look really close and you, and you think with just a normal kind of attentiveness, you go, in this future, there are no more wild beasts, but they dwell securely in the wilderness, which is desert, and in the woods, which is treed, right? So suddenly we're now in a world where there's this great, huge cube of a city, but then outside of the city there are things like a desert. There are places like woods, right? So the world that you know is not completely different than the world you're going to. It's just that the world you're going to is much more vast than the world you know. And so God is making this promise. This is how it's going to be, which I, I, what I love about this is we've already seen a mountain. Now we see desert. We see woods. Last week, we see that there are different fruits, 12 seasons, for the different fruits that are a part of the tree of life. And so now you're like, wait, this is a little bit more expansive and more what I understand this to be. Because again, I have mountain, I have woods, I have desert, I have seasons. Now let me tell you why I love the fact that it says that there are seasons. Ezekiel 34, 26. He says, and I will make them and the place around my hill, which is his creation. That's what it means in Ezekiel. The place around my hill, a blessing and I will send down the showers in their season, and they shall be showers of blessing. Right? I, I love this. So now you keep putting it together. We've got mountain. We've got river. We've got woods. We've got desert. Now we have showers. I love this. This morning I woke up at my house, looked out the window, and it was snowing. It was snowing. You're like, well, you're in the lowlands. You guys don't get the snow. I'm up in the hills. We get a little bit of snow. And, and, and I love the snow. You know, and I'm like, you know what? Rain in this season turns to snow. When you have rains in different seasons, you get different types of rains. It's not just, all right, at 2 o'clock every day, God gives a little 10-minute drizzle. Call it happy. 
right? God's trying to show that there's a richness of diversity, you know, in this. I, mean, I think about it even. I wonder if, if in this world there will be snow, and when we see it, we'll go, oh, man, there is the remembrance of how our sins were like scarlet, but then washed as white as snow. Like all of these different things that we see are God reminding us of his glory and his grace and his power and his forgiveness. I think about in the book of Job where it says that God shows his power in the thunder and in the lightning. You know, like the other day when it was really windy, I went and just stood in my yard and watched the trees just sway back and forth and just kind of stood in the midst of of strength, you know? And I'm like, man, this reminds me of the strength and power and might of God. I really do. I wonder if in that new world, God's going to be like, okay, it is 2 o'clock. It's time for the giant lightning storm that spans the entire horizon just to show I'm awesome. You know, that's the shower of the day. The shower of the day is like a giant, just like 4th of July. It'll be on December 25th. Everybody knows that's Jesus' real birthday. And, and, and it just... just just power unleashed, but not power that harms. Not the kind of power that then we have to go, how many will lose their life today? How many things will be destroyed? How long will my power be out? Right? But just power unleashed for the sake of worshiping God who is the God of all power. Right? So you have kings, you have nations, you have woods, you have deserts, you have rivers, you have seasons, you have showers in this coming new world. Now because of this, I would argue that this new world is physical and has therefore physical laws. Right? We're not talking like, hey, in the new world there's no physics. Again, I know students who get stoked about that. I don't believe that's how it works. There are still physics. Rivers still run downstream. You know? Clouds still form somehow. There is an environment within this world, and so even in those physics, I would say that as you have rivers they go someplace, and those someplace are usually bodies of water that we call seas, right? We call where rivers go seas. Now, in um, Ezekiel, it goes back a little bit further into Ezekiel 47, um, you, you have him, again, kind of outlining, you know, this is this future reality that you get to enjoy, that my people will enjoy. And so in Ezekiel chapter 46, or 47 rather, starting in verse 6, It says this angel says to Ezekiel, you have to come and see this, right? He says, son of man, you have to see this. And so he led me back to the bank of the river. And as I went back, I saw the bank of the river with very many trees on one side and on the other. And then he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down to the Arabia and enters the sea. And when the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. This is not now. We don't look and say, wherever fresh water goes, the sea turns fresh. We don't say that. It's like, no, the fresh water goes in the sea, and then it turns salty. But this is a very different world. And the river goes into the sea, and the sea turns fresh. And it says, and wherever the rivers go, every living creature that swarms will live. And there will be very many fish, for this water goes there. The waters of the sea, wherever they go, will become fresh so that everything that lives there or everything lives where the river goes. And so you you have this scene. Well, first of all, you just read that where you see rivers go into the sea and wherever the rivers are touching, everything swarms with life. Everything grows. Reminds me of Narnia. Every place that Aslan's foot goes to the turf, just flowers spring. Right? It's just like that sense of life springs where the river of life is going. Right? But I also look at this and go, wait, there's rivers and there's seas? All of God's kayakers and surfers said? Yeah. Right? I mean, you have to start thinking, this, this is, it's water. There's activity around this. There's life around this. Right? It's a great scene. And then you look at verse 11, right? Or verse 10, rather, says there's just seas and everything else. And it says, fishermen will stand beside the sea. And all God's anglers said. All right. So, fishermen will stand beside the sea. And so you go, that's pretty cool. You're like, why is there fishing? Do we eat meat? Like, that's the meat eaters want to know, right? I don't know. Here's what I do know. After Jesus was resurrected, what did he eat? He ate fish. If you say, you're not allowed to eat meat after you're resurrected, take it up with Jesus. He ate fish. All right, 
Now, some are saying, okay, so there's water and there's seas and there's fish, but fish without salt? Ugh. All right? But then it says that he keeps the swamps and the marshes, so they are left for salt, it says in verse 11. So, again, you, you just, you're getting a picture of a very expansive and diverse world. Kings, nations, mountains, rivers, seas, storms, showers, right? It's very different than what we picture. But then we also see that it's an agrarian type environment. Ezekiel 47, 12, it says, and on the banks of both sides of the river, there were growing all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail. They will bear fresh fruit every month because the water, from, uh, the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be good for food and their leaves will be good for healing. Right? So again, we, we are pretty um, spoiled as a people because we can get fruit all year round. But you go back when this was written, that's not how it worked. To hear that you could get fruit every single month would be just mind-blowing. Like, Wow, that's what it's going to be like? Yes, there's going to be fruit every single month. And, and the leaves will be for the healing of the nations. And, and you might even ask, well, why do you need leaves for healing? I don't know. I, I really don't know. You know, I wish I could have some really brilliant answer. I read different people, and some people are like, well, maybe you can still get bumped and bruised and scraped in heaven, you know? And I'm like, oh, could be, I don't know. But... but Again, it gives the idea that there, there's more going on in this world than maybe we sometimes understand. The fruit is for enjoyment. The leaves are for healing. And, and more and more, we're even finding, man, like God has given us natural elements for healing that maybe are more superior than the stuff we engineer in a laboratory. So again, this isn't even far-fetched. We're, we're already experiencing this. We already know this in some capacity, right? So again, this is all of this world that we are seeing, right? Now, I had somebody last week come up to me, and they said, okay, so you're saying there's fruit in heaven. So are there seeds in the fruit? It's kind of a cool question. It's like asking, did Adam have a belly button? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, did he have a belly button? You know? Um, so I thought about this. I'm like, yeah, do, 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 does fruit have seeds? Because then seeds would have to, quote, die, though that's probably human vernacular at best, and then fall to the ground, and they'd have to sprout again. Ezekiel 34, 27 says, And the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield its increase, and they shall be secure in the land. So it does seem like there's seeds and fruit, and it goes into the ground, and then the earth yields that fruit. So for those who ask, yeah, I think there's probably seeds. Seems to work out. So again, hopefully you're starting to stack up the layers. That's really what this message is today, just to go, here are the layers. Kings, nations, environments, water, rivers, seas, trees, fruit. What about animals? Well, we've seen that God says, oh, I deal with the wild beasts. There are no more wild beasts, so you can sleep in the woods, you can hang out in the desert, that kind of thing. Isaiah chapter 11 gives us another picture of the future, starting in verse 6. It says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. It's not that God eradicates the wild beasts. He domesticates the wild beasts. The wolf shall lay down or dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the lion and the fattened calf will all be together, and a little child will lead them. They're so domesticated. Can you imagine? Like, I mean, it, it's, it's Mowgli, you know? Just, just chilling with a giant bear that could eat me, but he likes me. He's my friend. You know, like, like a little child will be able to lead them. Now, other people will look and go, whoa, there's little children. I don't know. It's above my pay grade. I won't get into that. All right? It says in verse 7, the cow and the bear shall graze. The bear shall graze. And their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. That is not now. It says the nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. Imagine that mom. All right? Um, Jesus, are you sure? Are you sure? It's cobra in there, all right? And the weaned child shall put his hand in the Adler's den, and they shall not hurt or destroy, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. Um, again, it's a, it's a great scene because what you have there is that the knowledge of God infuses and informs everything, right? It infuses and informs appetite and 
DNA and instinct and all of those types of things. And so it's not a world completely different from our world. It's our world in a different way. Right? It's our world in the way that God intends it to be. It's a reprogrammed world in light of the resurrection. That's what you see. Now, I had somebody ask me, well, if there's animals, what about my pets? Are my pets resurrected? Above my pay grade, I do not know. But if God resurrects all things and creation has been yearning from the beginning for its restoration, I don't think it's a crazy thing to say, well, if God is going to resurrect all things and make all things new, who knows, maybe your pets are going to be there. I had another person ask me, well, what about can we communicate with animals? Right? And, and some people, as soon as they say, can we communicate with animals, are going to go, oh, man, now he's getting all weird. He's getting all sci-fi on us. So let me ask you a question. Can you now communicate with animals? Yeah, we already do, right? If you just go over the mountains and through the snow and over to Ellensburg, and you go to Central Washington University, and you go to their science department, you can meet primates who, who communicate with sign language. They communicate already. We've already trained animals to communicate, right? So I didn't say, do animals talk like, hey, what's going on? Good to see you, fellas. You know, like, <laughs> it, you know, I'm... I'm not trying to advocate that, you know what I mean? So, though it would be awesome. It would be so awesome, you know, if there was like a good fella's donkey in heaven or something. You know? Like, I think that would be super cool. But, but, but the idea that we already communicate with animals is true. In fact, you even go back to Eden, and it talks about how there was the serpent that communicated with Eve, and everybody's like, why was she not freaking out that there was like a snake talking to her? And we go, well, maybe the reality is we, we call it talking, and maybe more it was communicating, but maybe people and animals had more of a way to communicate then, and we've sort of lost it, and only now as a civilization or as a people, we're beginning to really plug back into how you can leverage that with dolphins or with primates or things like that. So again, we're not talking far-fetched. We're doing this stuff now, but perhaps in the future, that communication will be even more uh, potent. So again... Stack it up. Right? You have all these things. You have plants, you have animals, you have rivers, you have mountains, you have nations, you have kings. But again, some of this sounds very rugged to me, which is why we go, is there more maybe physical structure beyond the new Jerusalem? And uh, in Isaiah 65, we begin to see a little bit of that. Isaiah 65, starting in verse 21, talks about this future time because we know it's future from verse 17 of Isaiah 65 where he says, behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. He says that in verse 17. So there's no debate. What he's describing in this chapter is about a future time. And so he's creating a new heavens and a new earth and what is in this new heavens and new earth? Uh, verse 21, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. It doesn't just say when you get there, there are houses. It says you get to build them. You get to work with the elements. You get to construct something. You get to plant a vineyard. And guess what? For some people who every year you plant something only to watch it die, it won't die. Right? We've already established earlier, it says there's going to be these trees on the banks of the river with fruit and their leaves never what? withers so when you go i have not i haven't put water on those tomatoes in seven days you're gonna go out there and look huh, didn't need to you know like all right somehow they just water in there you know and so you know you you have a home you have a vineyard you have the promise of being the perfect green thumb you know it's fantastic i love that and you enjoy your labors now it doesn't just stop with a home there will be some homes that are even larger. Ezekiel 34 talks about this. It says, Ezekiel 34, 29, he says, I will provide for them. So this is different. You will build, but now he is providing. This is a little bit different. It's, I, I think, again, to the least, they're the greatest. And there's all kinds of shade of, of, of advancement in there based on how you live in this life. There's different reward in the life to come. Some, you're building your house. But others, in verse 29, I will provide for them renowned plantations so that they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land and no longer suffer the reproach of the nations. So some, it's home and vineyard. Others, it's plantation. If you've ever been to like um, Mount Vernon, and I don't mean north of us, I mean George Washington's Mount Vernon, 
and, and, and you've just taken a tour of the history of it. What's cool about a plantation, I think in our mind, we, we kind of get very narrow. We go, oh, okay, so they, they grow food and have a few animals. One of the coolest things about that, though, is saying if you're going to run a plantation, you have to always be thinking in terms of technology and ingenuity and how you make things and fix things and build things and innovate things so that you can run it better. Uh, one of the coolest things about a plantation is it's a little microcosm of creativity always creating, always thinking, always advancing something. And so in that sense, they, they will have these little spaces where maybe more ingenuity is happening there than maybe just in the typical home of the vineyard. Then you have a plantation with ingenuity, creativity, and a little bit more expansion, right? So again, the very, very diverse scapes before us. Now, if we have homes and we have homesteads, can we go bigger? Can we have something like other cities in these nations? Well, Luke 19 begins to talk about that. Jesus is uh, getting ready to tell a parable. And Luke 19, 11 says, As he heard these things, he proceeded to tell them a story. Right? He says, Because they supposed that the kingdom of God was about to immediately appear. So he's saying, yeah, I'm going to tell you about the kingdom of God. This future thing that we're all to enjoy. Let me tell you how this thing kicks out, he says. The bottom line is, is, I'll tell you a story about this guy who's going to go off on a trip and he's going to come back with a reward. And so he gives each of his employees uh, about three months worth of wage to do something with. He says, stay busy, advance it, do something for the cause. And so each one of these people takes it and does a different thing, right? One invests, another invests differently. And then the third one says, I'm just going to hold on to it. I'm not going to do any investment. I'm not going to be busy uh, with the business of my master. I'm going to do my thing, not his thing. And in the end of the story, the one that says, I'm going to do my thing, not his thing, that one ends up basically in hell because the story is about one's future state. He ends up in hell because you didn't want to be about God's business and so you didn't want God and so now you have an existence without God. But the other two made an investment. And so the first came before him and said, I took the three months worth of salary and man, from that, I ended up with uh, tenfold what you gave to me. And Jesus says, because you've been faithful in very little, you shall have authority over what? Over ten cities. And the other guy was faithful, and he made a little bit less. And Jesus says, I will give you authority over five cities. Now, again, the parable is a parable about the kingdom, about the future state of all things. And so we just keep trickling back up now. We started with kings and nations and looked at all of the uniqueness and then came back around through homes and plantations. And now we see that there are cities and people have responsibility over cities somehow. Now, again, if you ask me, well, what does that mean? And how does that work? And what's that like? And do you have to go to council meetings? Because that sounds like hell now. And, you know, um, <laughs> you know it's like, you know, do you, is it a lot of government employees? Because that's a lot of, that's a lot. good thing that, you know, New Jerusalem's made of gold. Uh, you know, and so, like, you could get into all of that minutia, and I don't know how it works. I'm just saying that there is a structure beyond what we sometimes do with this. It gets very narrow for us, right? And I want us to see it's a world that is far and wide. It's rich and diverse, right? It's got open scapes and it's got wooded spaces and it's got cities and it's got plantations and it's got homes and it's got vineyards and it's got rain. It's got seasons, it's got fruit, it's got fresh water, but it has salty patches just for the sake of the salt, right? All of that shows us probably something that we don't typically envision when we think about heaven. And then this is what I love about this whole giant risk map that we just painted, right? Um, all of this is, is not meant to be like, you just go live here, and you just go live there, and everybody just goes finds a little spot and calls it good. Now, this is a utopia that's designed to be interconnected. It's an interconnected utopia. And we see this with the reality that there is travel. There's travel. In Isaiah 60, we begin to see this unfold. What I love about this is it says, you know what, when you die, you don't retire your passport. All right, this is what's cool. There is some sense of travel. Isaiah chapter 60, starting in verse 3. God is making this promise to, to Jerusalem. He says, yeah, you guys are always under siege. Everybody's always against you. You're always having to fight. But one day, Jerusalem, I will change it. I will make all things new. You will be celebrated. Everybody, all the nations will come to you. 
all the nations will celebrate that you are the center, center of my redemptive purpose, right? That's what's going on in Isaiah 60. And so in verse 3 it says, and the nations shall come to your light, which is just what Revelation 21 was talking about. The nation shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. So the kings of the earth will want to come and see. And then it goes into verse 5. And you shall see and be radiant, and your heart shall thrill and exult, because the abundance of the sea shall be returned to you, and the wealth of the nations shall come to you. Right? When, it, when it says there that the abundance of the seas shall be turned to you, what it's talking about is ships bringing goods over the sea to, to the new Jerusalem. There's travel. right? So ships are going to bring something, it says here. They're going to bring the wealth of the nations. They're going to shower the new Jerusalem with adoration and with praise and with thanksgiving and with glory because who dwells there? God and the Lamb and that is the light of that city. Right? So that means they're traveling to this place to do that. Continues on. Right? Perhaps even the travel is more diverse than ships. I won't get into this, but it is interesting in verse 8 where it says, And who are these that fly like clouds and like doves to their windows? He's talking about people bringing things. He says, the ships are coming. But then who are these that fly like clouds? Now, until Orbel and Wilbur Wright, we would have been like, I don't know. There are people flying clouds, dude. You know, like, but boy, we're, we live in a world where this isn't far-fetched. It isn't crazy. We fly to places all the time in our travel. I don't know if that's what verse 8 is really saying or not, but I think it's interesting simply to note that the world that we know and how we travel is perhaps not totally crazy from the world to come and how we travel there. Now, again, why do they travel? Well, it says... To bring children from afar, their silver and their gold with them. This is what it's saying at the second half of verse 9. For the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has made you beautiful. People are coming uh, in some ways to uh, almost be like sightseers. I want to see the new Jerusalem where God dwells. And I want to bring offerings to new Jerusalem where God dwells. And so people are coming with their offerings to this place in celebration. It's almost a type of holy, healthy pilgrimage. Now it goes on to say, in verse 11, Your gates shall be open continually. Day and night they shall not be shut, that the people may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings as they lead in procession. All right? Now back in Revelation 21, 26, it says they will bring in the glory and honor of the nations. Now, again, we start to get a little narrow, and we start to picture a bunch of people in robes bringing gold, frankincense, and myrrh with camels, right? This is a, this is we're so stuck sometimes, right? And 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 I go wait, I, I see this is potentially different because again, you have vast wealth, vast time, vast ingenuity. Your mind is not limited by the confines of this world. You have a lot higher IQ now in this world. You have a lot more time and energy to develop things. And I believe what's really going to be going on is the nations will be celebrating the creativity of God as creators to create whatever their nation creates, and they bring that as a tribute to God's glory. It's worship. The nations spend their days in the worship of God through creating, through innovating, through doing, through living, through enjoyment, through pleasure, all the things that God has made the eternal state for, and they work together collectively, and then they say, we want to bring to God. Matter of fact, remember in Revelation where it says the elders throw their crowns before God? It's this idea that they say, all that you've given to me, I give back to you in worship. So in the same way, the nations are saying, all that you've given to us, God, we bring back to you in worship. Newing newness. Every season, every year, something new they bring to the new Jerusalem. That their nation, their people, their group has created. The kings come in with ambassadors of the nations and say, here's what we have done to celebrate your greatness. Here's what has been cultivated. Here's what's been established. We're bringing our honor and glory, right? Because that's what it says, the honor and glory of the nations. Every nation has, like, honor and glory. It has diversity, it has uniqueness, it has architecture and art and cuisine. And, and those kinds of things are brought. Here's what we bring to you because we love you, because we worship you, because you're altogether good and wise. 
So you have to remember, back in Eden, the Creator gave a mandate, which was go and create. Go and tame. Go and uh, have dominion over. We, we were called to this, but all of that was to be for His glory. And so in the future final state, that, that mandate would just continue without all the impediments that we, we experience and, and sense today. Potentially quite an amazing reality before us. Everything newing, newer all the time. What is also cool is it seems that these contributions aren't just like, oh, put them in a warehouse someplace. Like, that's cool. Here is your crystal cube because you have a patent. Now put it in a box somewhere. It doesn't seem to work like that. In fact, I'm going to kind of string together some verses here in Isaiah 60. It says here, this is part of God's promise for the future New Jerusalem. He says in verse 10, foreigners shall build up your walls and their kings shall minister to you. So the city, uh, it's a speculation, this is so a speculation, right? But the city starts off 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles, but it seems to give this idea that it doesn't mean that the city stays 1,400 miles. There's this idea in which there's an adding to this new Jerusalem, right? It says in verse 13, the glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the plain, and the pine, to beautify the place of my sanctuary. People keep coming and beautifying the new Jerusalem keep bringing their innovation, their technology. It's the center of, of that final world. That's the capital city. But that capital keeps developing, keeps growing, keeps innovating. It says in verse 17, instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. So the elements are much more exotic. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stone, I will bring iron. I will make your overseers peace and your taskmasters. They will be righteous. It says in verse 14, the sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you, and all who despise you shall bow at your feet. They shall call you the city of the Lord, the Zion, the Holy One of Israel. It says, whereas you have been forsaken and hated with no one passing through, I will make you majestic forever, a joy from age to age. Right? Where the world so often has stood against God's holy city, now the world will add to Build in, build up, celebrate God's holy city. It's a very different world. See, that is the world that we are heading to, right? That is the world. That whole thing, right? And, and again, I'm just kind of trying to pull together the different verses that you can't even expand on all of this like we wish we could. It's so limited to do that. But that's what you'll experience that's what you'll enjoy. That's where you'll add. That's where you will breathe in the fresh air. Because you'll breathe in air. Because it's real and tangible. And I believe in that there will be the joy of exploration. We will explore the vast wonder of God's creation. All right? And when I say exploration... I don't just mean exploring the woods or the deserts. I don't just mean exploring the seas or the city... I honestly, and this is again a speculation, I'm going to build a case really fast. I, I, I wonder in this resurrected world if we explore beyond just this resurrected world. Now here's why I say this. Uh, in Isaiah 65, 17, what does he say? He says, I create a new heavens, plural. I create a new heavens and a new earth. In Revelation 21, it's singular. I create a new heaven and earth and it's a unified Heaven and earth as, as one, the heaven and earth touch, our prayer, may it come on earth as it is in heaven, is fulfilled. But here in Isaiah, he says, you know, I create a new heavens as well as a new earth. Now, in Psalm 19, starting in verse 1. Psalm 19, starting in verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies above proclaim his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Now, what do we know about the world? Well, the world is without end. And so in this world to come, right, uh, we will look into the cosmos. We will stand in some nation, maybe on some little homestead somewhere, and we will look up, and now we will see with perfect clarity how the heavens declare the glory of God. 
They will speak. They will preach. They will communicate. We will see just how glorious he is, right? Eternity is about an endless wonder. Matter of fact, that's how we're going to end our series next week, the endless wonder of God. And I believe it's going to be endless wonder because we will go to the new Jerusalem and we'll see the glory and technology and innovation of that place. We'll see its uniqueness and there will be glorifying God. And we'll look throughout all the earth and we'll see the diversity of the nations and kings and places and landscapes and architecture and just the various beauty. But then we will also look into the heavens and see the mystery and the hugeness. And even in there, as you get into it more, the fineness and the smallness that also has a different level of mystery. See, right now, with telescopes and microscopes, we look very crudely at the wonder of God. I mean, very crudely. In fact, for thousands of years, all we've done is just look up at the night sky and went, it's a lot of white dots. And then just in in recent years, we've been able to look very differently. In fact, uh, I think right here, this picture right here, you see, um, if you take just what most people have seen for Centuries, it's just a bunch of dots in the night sky, but then we put this thing up called Hubble. It's a very crude telescope, and we said, let's take it and not, let's not look at a white dot, but let's look at a black space. And so we just had to look at a black space for 10 days, because it's just black. What's in a black space? And with this very crude instrument, we, we, we saw this. All these blips and dots of color and spiral and everything else. And, 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 you know, you might go, well, what are all those things? They're just colorful things. Now, every one of those is a galaxy. Every one of those has roughly 100 billion stars, 100 billion suns in each one of those little blips. Right? And, and if you have 100 billion stars, you realistically probably have a few planets floating around those. So hundreds of billions of planets. And then some of those are going to have moons. So hundreds and hundreds of billions of of moons floating around planets, floating around stars, and then they estimate there's hundreds of billions of galaxies. See, we explore this little teeny marble, and we use this very crude instrument to look. Now, if we peer in a little bit deeper, we might see something like this. This is called the Eagle Nebula. You go, okay, that's pretty cool as it is, but then you look a little deeper, and I want to see more. So we look a little deeper, and we see more. We go, I'm going to look deeper still and see more, and then you see this image. The pillars of creation. This is just one, this is one piece of art in God's giant cosmic museum. Right? Tragically, this doesn't even exist anymore. This, this went out a long time ago. So there's things currently happening that we will never see because it takes too long for the light to come. But one day, will we be the great explorers? Will we see Psalm 19 lived out in our lives in a completely different way than we ever envisioned? Only now we're beginning to look at DNA and go, how do we store so much in DNA? Right? But, but, but maybe one day we'll explore deeply into that and we'll see the wonder and awe and, and, and the ingenuity of God and all the more what we're going to do is give him glory. We will worship God in an ever-expanding place, an ever-wondrous reality. And that's why I say it's not like you're going to a lesser world. You are leaving a world of copy and shadow for a world more robust, more romantic, more exquisite, more powerful, more deep than this world that you've ever known. Let's go ahead and pray together. Jesus, I pray that you will give us imagination, that you will give us hunger, that you will give us awe, that you will give us a longing for for our true home. Every time we see a little glimpse in this world, I pray that it gives us a hunger. Every sunrise or sunset, every great blanket of snow, every lightning storm, every beautiful flower that peeks through the soil, every time we see something like the smile of a child, or we see the good, kind effort of one to a person in need, whatever it is, that all of those things would couple our hearts to what is to come. And that we will long for that because we long for you. I pray that you shape a robust vision for us of heaven, of this new world, and of your glory to come. We love you and need you in your name.